Welcome to day three of Ambition and today's multi-sensory worship experience. So much has happened since Friday. You have been stretched, you have been present, God has been speaking to you and hopefully growing your longing for Jesus and for justice. And hopefully your understanding of worship is also being stretched as well. You know, I love, love, love singing. I call it my love language with God. It is one of my favorite ways to meet Jesus. But about 11 years ago, I had a vocal cord injury that forever changed my voice and my ability to, to sing and to speak in the ways that my heart longs to. I've been praying for healing for 11 years and I will continue to pray for that. But I'm also grateful for how that limitation has forced me to expand my understanding of worship. It's created a deeper hunger in me and stronger muscles to seek God's face. It's made me view caring for my body and pursuing justice and preparing meals for my family as acts of worship. I've learned to just rest in God's presence instead of feeling pressure to, to do something. Maybe you have met God in a new and surprising way like through breathing or listening to scripture being read aloud, or as you walked around outside and enjoyed creation. I want to hear or see how you have stretched yourself in worship, so drop a picture or a line on the Ambition Network homepage with the hashtag worship stretch to share a way, a new way that you've practiced worship and what that was like for you. I'll think about that as well, so look out for my worship stretch later today. But really, I hope that the limitations of the pandemic would grow your hunger for Jesus and expand your worship language. So today we're going to learn a new prayer exercise. We'll meet God through music and the word, and we'll prepare to receive from God on this last day of the conference. And now I want to give a pastoral word on how to engage this last day of ambition. I remember as a student getting to this point in a conference and experiencing a little dissonance between how I thought I was supposed to feel and how I actually felt. So some of my friends would be super hype, ready to go, like, I want to have a million spiritual conversations right now. And I desired those things as well. But internally, I was just nervous or afraid. Um, I was intimidated and very aware that I had like little to offer God. And maybe you relate to my friends or maybe you relate to me. But either way, I just want to remind you that you were just as sent on Friday as you are today. You were just as sent as you came into this conference as you are today because this is our identity as followers of Jesus, as ones who are sent. Sent to testify in word, deed, and power of who Jesus is. And we're not sent in our own strength to prove ourselves or to perform. We're not sent detached from reality, right? We we are sent in weakness and in humility with total dependence on God. We are sent with clear eyes to see the reality of the world, but also spiritual eyes to see what could be through the power of the Holy Spirit. So as we enter into worship today, untense any muscles that might be clenched, relax your body, let's ask Jesus to meet us here today. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, God, and we long for more of you. We want to meet you in the sacred space of our rooms or as we go on a walk, the space we've created by putting on headphones. Jesus, we want to meet you here, Lord. Would you have our hearts be receptive and open and ready to say yes, Jesus, to what you have in store for us today. We pray these things in your name. Amen.
I'm your beloved, you are my father, we are your children, your sons and your daughters, we're longing for you, Lord will you come, Lord we are weary, in need of revival, so come Holy Spirit, and root out our idols, Oh, how we need you, Lord, here we are. We're crying out, holy are you, Lord, and worthy we adore you, Jesus. All we are is yours. You one who made us and you're pleased to embrace us before we could ever earn your love we're your beloved you made us with honor but now we're ashamed of the pain that we caused and still when you see us Call us your own Lord, we are desperate We're broken and tired Of suffering all of the pain and the violence Come Holy Spirit Light up the dark And holy are you Sustain us with all we could ever need and more. Oh, we long to see your power come in fullness, God.
Today, for our embodied worship, we're going to take a journey back in time to pray like the ancient Celtic church, planted by Patrick and others 1,500 years ago in Ireland. The early Celtic Christians were famous for integrating their worship with the world around them, communing with God through natural elements, cycles, and rhythms. They would engage their whole bodies, like the kind of prayer we will join in today called circling prayer. In circling prayer, the worshiper would draw a circle in the dirt around them or their families, generating a kind of sacred space and calling down blessings from God to those within and protection from evil forces that lie outside the circle. So while most of you may not be standing in the dirt right now, where you can draw a visible circle around you with your feet, I invite you to stand up where you are. Come on, you're all used to this by now. If you're with others, spread out a little bit. You don't need to see your screen, as I will say each part of the prayer first, and you can repeat what you hear. So take a a moment to find your space, at least arm's length away from anyone else. Go ahead and take a deep breath in. Hold it. And breathe out. Once more. Breathe in. And out. Next, take your toe and slowly draw an imaginary circle around you. Clockwise, all circles in Celtic worship would be drawn in this way, aligned with the rhythms found in nature. So now you're standing inside a circle, and Jesus is standing with you. I want to invite you to extend your hands wide, just touching the edge of your imaginary circle. If you like, you can just listen to the words and repeat them as you turn around clockwise during each verse. I'll read the verse and my friend Tom will repeat it. You can say the verse out loud along with Tom. So as you turn around clockwise, listen to this and repeat. Circle me, O God. Keep hope within, keep despair without. Circle me, O God. Keep hope within, keep despair without. Circle me, O God. Keep peace within, keep turmoil without. Circle me, O God. Keep peace within, keep turmoil without. Circle me, O God, keep calm within, keep storms without. Circle me, O God, keep calm within, keep storms without. Circle me, O God, keep strength within, keep weakness without. Circle me, O God. Keep strength within, keep weakness without. Circle me, O God, keep healing within, keep disease without. Circle me, O God, keep healing within, keep disease without. Amen. Amen. Circling prayer can also be done in an intercessory way by expanding our circles successively outward, turning in a circle, arms extended, circling our house, our campus, our neighborhood community, our city, our country, our world. Consider coming back to this prayer later today or this week. Like yesterday, I'm going to lead us into a time of listening prayer. God is always speaking to his children in many different ways. And one way God can speak very personally is through our unique imaginations. So we're going to listen 
for what Jesus is saying to us. I'm going to give you some prompts and then pause to let God stir your imagination. You don't need to dim the lights or put on meditation music at all. And it's always okay if you don't see or hear anything. We just want to make room to listen to and to encounter God. We simply want to make space to encounter God. So close your eyes and imagine yourself sitting in a small room where you feel safe. The same one from yesterday's listening prayer. Take a moment to look around the room again. How are you feeling about meeting with Jesus today? Again, Jesus is there with you, greeting you. How does he greet you today? Take in what it feels like to be with Jesus again. How do you respond when he shows up? Yesterday, you spent time looking out the window with Jesus. And today, Jesus draws your attention to the door of your room. What kind of door is it? Is it heavy or light? What does it look like? Jesus motions that he is inviting you to follow him out through the door, to go with him somewhere. Where is he inviting you to go with him? How do you feel about going with him? What questions or concerns come up for you? As you are about to open the door, Jesus pauses and turns to listen to you. He wants to make space for your concerns, and he is inviting you to ask him anything. What do you ask? How does Jesus respond to you? What does he say or do? As you leave the door, what is it like to go with Jesus? Are you walking? Running? Afraid? Excited? Thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to us personally. Amen. Take a moment to jot down anything you saw or heard and what it meant to you. It's always okay if you didn't experience anything specific. 
But if you did, I encourage you to share it. Text it to someone from your campus or greenhouse group either now or between worship and the main session. I invite you to read aloud with me the Word of God. Acts 16, 16 through 40. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the market's place to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful to us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaking. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains became loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, They beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates. And when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the other brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. So, when Paul mentions signs and wonders and the power of the Holy Spirit in Romans 15, 9, he's drawing from a Jewish tradition and understanding that Yahweh was a powerful God who was willing to demonstrate the full measure of his strength to save his people. Paul also understood the spiritual reality around us. He tells us in Ephesians 6 that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the demonic forces that are at work in our world. So, as a result, we're supposed to put on the armor of God every single day and go to war. 
I love that we get to see how Paul engages in that spiritual battle. In the first story, we see a slave girl with the spirit of divination. Her owners have no power to change her spiritual condition, but they're willing to benefit from it. The evil spirit recognizes Paul and Silas as servants of God. It recognizes that they proclaimed the way of salvation. Paul wasn't messing around in Romans when he said that he proclaimed the gospel in word, deed, and power. Even demons recognize this truth. In the second story, we see that God responds to Paul and Silas's prayers of worship with an earthquake that brings freedom, not just for him and Silas, but redemption for the jailer and his family. When Christians pray and walk in righteousness and the authority of the Holy Spirit, doors of oppression and injustice are blown off their hinges. So why do we plant? We plant because there is a spiritual war happening, uh, happening on every corner of every campus every single day of our lives. And, when we, and we get to partner with the Holy Spirit to free our friends from every sort of oppression on campus. I once met a student named Gabriel who came to faith because he saw a demon walking down an alley. During his gangbanger days, he was responsible for keeping watch of the alley behind the drug house. He was out there one night and saw a demon walking towards him, so Gabriel put his shotgun down and gave his life to Jesus that night. I once knew a student at Caltech, a really smart guy. I tried every argument to win him over, and the thing that brought him to faith was the display of God's power one day when I cast a demon out of a student at chapter camp. I've seen the spiritual reality on our campuses, I've seen miracles, and even this year, I've heard stories of students being healed on Zoom meetings during this pandemic. Why? Because our friends around the country understand the power that they have in Jesus. Ambition. We plant because people are in all sorts of bondage on our campuses. Depression, anxiety, loneliness, suicidal thoughts, anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, envy. I could keep going. But what I want to say is that things are different in Jesus. There is joy, freedom, community, love, reconciliation, redemption. We plant because our campuses hunger for these things. Jesus is making all things new and we get to participate in that story. So why do we plant? Well, we plant now because we understand that when people are transformed, it has an impact on their families. When Lydia comes to faith, she and her household are baptized. Her decision to say yes to Jesus has an impact on the rest of her family. When the jailer asks, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas answer, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your family. The power of God at work in Paul and Silas creates an opportunity for the jailer to come to faith. And they speak the word of the Lord to everyone in, the, in his house. And all of them come to faith that day and are baptized. What I want to say about this is that at this point in your lives, most of you don't fully understand the impact that your decision to participate in God's story will have on your friends' families 20 years from now. You might be thinking that you want to start a Bible study, but God is thinking about breaking chains of oppression that have existed in families for generations. We are coming to the end of our time together in this worship experience. And I want you to be able to continue the journey of encountering God in new ways. 
So in your ambition welcome kit, you should have received a little finger labyrinth. It kind of looks like a superhero medallion. If you didn't receive one, no worries. We will drop the file on Ambition Network so you can download it and print it out yourself. A labyrinth is usually done outdoors as a walking meditation. And you should totally Google labyrinth locator because there might be one near you and you can actually do this walking practice outside. But for the finger labyrinth, there are instructions there, but essentially you take your finger and slowly trace inward to the center. And as you move inward, you express and release any failures, any worries, any longings to God who is gracious. And at the center, you pause to receive. You rest in the love of Jesus. You spend as much time there as you want. And when you're ready, you trace your finger back out towards the edges, representing the reality that we are sent into the world. And as you move outward, you pray for God's kingdom to come, for revival, for flourishing in our own lives and the lives of those around us. This is really a wonderful summary of our worship experience the last three days and of the conference as a whole. We've brought our whole selves to Jesus. We have spent time in this beautiful, intimate space receiving from God. And we also remember as we go that we are sent in partnership with the Holy Spirit. So think of this as your multi-sensory worship experience parting gift. It has been so good to worship together. I would love to hear some stories of how God met you during this time. So look out for that thread on Ambition Network. And blessings to you as you go into the last day of Ambition. Bye. <laughs>